Experiences page. And in the upper right hand of that page, you'll see the title of tonight's talk and just click on that title of the talk and then you can download the handout um, of all the, all the points I'll be covering tonight and also a list of recommended readings as well. So you might find that helpful as we're going through the talk tonight. Okay, thanks, Kate. Okay, um, so to quickly kick us off, um, as Kate will get started here in a minute, um, thank you everybody for joining us for our Monday evening series. It's exciting to see um, so many familiar names popping in, and um, these seem to be getting more and more well attended, so we're excited to have you all here. Um, I'm Betsy Norris, I'm the Executive Director and the Founder of Adoption Network Cleveland. Um, and before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items. Um, one is if everybody would please mute your microphone through the course of the whole hour that we have together. This will en enhance our sound quality. Um, you can also turn off the camera, that's up to you. Um, if you're on a laptop or a desktop computer, you've got different settings that you can choose. And probably the spotlight setting is the one that will um, make the presentation look the best for you. So that would be in the lower bottom corner of your screen. You can choose change layout and then choose the spotlight setting if you want to do that. Um, we will be recording this evening's presentation and making it available for later viewing. Those um, will be on our website and the three um, Monday evening speaker series that we've had so far are already there. Um, and uh, in terms of questions and answers, um, after Kate's presentation, we will be having um, some question and answers. And there's a few different ways that you can submit questions. So um, when you registered, you had an opportunity to submit questions for the people who did. Those have been given to Kate. And uh, it sounds like a lot of those are incorporated within her presentation already. Um, if you have a question during the course of the presentation, you can submit it using the chat box. And I'll be monitoring those and posing them to Kate during the question and answer period. Or if you'd prefer to um, do something more privately because your name does show in the chat box, um, you can submit something to me in email, which is Betsy, B-E-T-S-I-E -E dot Norris at adoptionnetwork.org. I also put that in chat. Um, so you can email me directly if you want to. Um, so we hope that this series will provide opportunities for community exploration and comfort. And it's designed to nurture our spirits during this difficult time that we're all living through right now. Um, and the speakers in the series are all generously donating their time. And as I mentioned, we are posting the recordings. Um, April 6th, we had Sharon Rosia. April 13th, we had April Dinwiddie. Uh, last week, April 20th, we had Leslie Johnson. And then tonight, of course, we've got Kate Vogel. Um, we do have speakers for the first three weeks in May that are scheduled. And um, we're open to hearing any of your ideas about future topics after that. But we have um, planned coming up our um, Dr. Jennifer King on May 4th, um, talking about Beyond ACEs, Understanding Trauma, the Brain, and Resilience. Um, on May 11th, we are having Moses Farrow talking about exploring racism and how to prevent it. And then the week after that on May um, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the dates in front of me, May 18th, is uh, Leslie Pate McKinnon with her talk entitled, Welcome to the House of Mirrors, the Importance of Preparing for Reunion. Um, you can take a look at our calendar on our website for details about all of those presentations and to register. Um, and now I have the pleasure of introducing Kate, Kate St. Vincent Vogel, um, our presenter this evening. Her topic is the ups and downs of your adoption story. You should write a book. Um, we've all heard that, and Kate actually did it. Um, Kate's the author of Lost and Found, a Memoir of Mothers, which came out in 2009. Her story was featured on national ABC News and was named by the Akron Beacon Journal as one of the best of the year. In addition to being a writer, Kate has a law degree, and she's an adoptee with um, 25 years into reunion. Her, her birth mother is um, here with us, with us this evening as well. Um, I'm proud to say that um, Kate's birth mother, Val, uh, served on our board for many years um, when we were a much newer, smaller organization. Um, Kate's essays have been highly acclaimed and appear in best-selling anthologies and other literary publications. Um, and Kate has presented at national writing conferences, international adoption conferences and forums. Um, and Kate teaches fiction and memoir writing at The Loft, which is the country's largest creative writing center. 
But for more information on Kate or to get her outline for this evening, you can go to katevogel.com. And with that, I'll give you Kate. Thanks. Thank you so much, Betsy. I really appreciate it. And you guys, you also need to know um, what an honor it is for me to present here this evening because of the role that Betsy um, played in my life and in Val's life, um, my birth mom's life. Um, it is because of Betsy and the good work that the Adoption Network Cleveland does that, um, that Val was able to find me through my adoptive mom's obituary. So um, it really is a treat to be able to be a part of uh, this uh, speaking ser speaker series this, uh, this evening. And it's an honor too to have all of you here this, with me this evening. Um, it is, uh, these are long days that we have now, having to work through quarantine, having to do all of our work online. And um, it's especially difficult for those of us touched by adoption. Um, being required to maintain social distancing can be particularly triggering for those of us um, in adoption. So I've been thinking of you all and um, my thoughts are with you and really glad that you're here with us this evening. We have a lot to cover tonight, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, as I mentioned, the handout is available um, on the website, um, and I'll also be posting uh, some of a PowerPoint here for you to follow along as well, uh, and I'll be toggling back and forth between, uh, between the two, so my face and then also the PowerPoint. Know that... Um, what I talk about this evening is largely about writing memoir. Um, and th however, if you choose to write in fiction, then what I will be covering is just as applicable for fiction. If there is a difference, then I will be noting that difference through the course of my talk as well. Know that um, it might be helpful to start by with a definition of the difference between fiction and memoir. Fiction, of course, is things that are made up. And basically, um, it can be completely made up. Um, uh, the people are made up, the events are made up, or it could be taking somebody that you know and combining them with at least one other person that you know um, into a fictional person or taking uh, two or more events and combining them into something bigger. Um, that would be something that is fictional. And then memoir is basically a subset of creative nonfiction. And nonfiction, of course, is not made up. So it is the truth. It is your truth in recording that. And the creative part of it is just that you're telling it in a way that is compelling them for the reader to read and follow. So just wanted to start out with those definitions um, that might be helpful as we go through our talk tonight. So. I'll be presenting this um, basically uh, from the standpoint of writing the writing memoir, but know that because it's just as applicable when you're writing fiction, whenever I say you, then um, in talking about you as the person in the story, know that you can just replace it with your protagonist if you want to write it as fiction instead. We can talk about some of the differences on um, why you would choose to do that instead. Um, so I want to start by... Um, we're going to start out by sharing some big picture things to be thinking about, whether you're writing fiction or memoir. And then I'll talk about the, the challenge of sharing the family secrets and what to do about that, what guidelines other, other writers have, um, more experienced writers have, what guidelines they have followed and, and what they bumped up against in, in following those guidelines. And then I'll give you tips on how to be able to write and shape your story. So those are the big things that I'll be covering this evening. So then in order to do that, I wanna start with the big picture. Um, there are three questions I want you to be thinking about as, um, as you think about writing your story. And these questions, again, um, are true whether or not, are, are things you need to think about whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction. And um, if we were, if we had all the time in the world, I would let you just write out the answer to these while I'm presenting. Um, but what I'm going to do is just give you the questions to be thinking about and then take time and just give yourself a minute or 90 seconds to answer each of these questions. What comes to you right off the top of your head is the answer. Don't worry about whether or not it's the right answer. It's what comes to you is something that is valid and something to follow. And you can use that as a guideline to follow in, um, in what it is that is important to write about for you. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to start with um, the big, 
the big picture questions to be thinking about. And for that, then I want to move to the slideshow. And that is, it's a little awkward as I move that. Um, so the first thing to be thinking about is when your reader is done with your book, what do you want them to be thinking about when they close the page, when they close the end of the book? What do you want their takeaway to be? I want you to be mindful of that and use that as a guidance for you to think about what it is you'll need to include in your story. I want you to also be thinking about what feeling you want them, you want to leave with them. If you want them to be sad about something, sad um, or feel bittersweet about something or to feel joyful, then you got to make sure that you're building those emotions into the story that you're telling. Also be mindful of thinking, what about your past is essential to share? Because that those are the only things you'll be including in the book, only the important things. Um, when you are thinking about writing memoir. Memoir is all about what it is that you leave out of the story and fiction is all about what it is that you leave in. The next thing you wanna be thinking about as far as a big picture item is you gotta think about why is it urgent to share your story now? This is something you always wanna be thinking about when you're writing a story. What else is happening in your life or in the world that makes it essential for you to um, tell your story? And if you're mindful of that, then you'll be able to convey that urgency to the reader as well. Another reason for you to be thinking about this is when we're writing our story, we are two people within the story. We are not only the person acting within the story, but we are also the person narrating the story. So um, Virginia Woolf called this the I now versus the I then. So be mindful of you playing two parts within one story and take advantage of that. Take advantage of what wisdom you have now because of all, the th all of the things that you have gone through um, and take advantage of sharing that with the reader. And then the third thing I want you to be thinking about when you're thinking about the big picture of writing your story is what or who is keeping you from writing your story? Who or what is keeping you from writing your story? Let's talk about that because that can is a really can be a really complicated answer so let me go back to um, where you can see my face um, there might be a few reasons why um, something is keeping you from writing your story um, the first one could be an issue with perfectionism. Um, we have this notion of what a story should be like, what it should read like on the page. Um, we have a notion of how good it's gonna be. It's gonna be good because everyone reacts in a certain way when we tell the story, they're like, oh, you have to write that. And they're like, I know, I gotta write it. So then what you start writing in is just not landing on the page as, as you think it should. And um, what can you do about that? <laughs> one is you need to know, when you are getting your story down on the page and just putting it onto the page for the first time, um, that first draft, everyone has a really crummy first draft and just know that that's the case. The first time we're getting the story down is um, you are just telling the story to yourself. You're figuring out what the whole of the story is. So let yourself get that story, um, whatever it is, onto the page. And once it's on the page, then you can figure out what to do with it. Know that that first draft um, Jane Smiley set up, um, she established, um, she had Pulitzer Prize winning Jane Smiley, establishes what it is that a first draft needs to do. And she says, um, all it needs to do is exist. So that's the only thing you need to worry about. The first time you're writing it is just get it down on the page and then you can figure out what to do with it. Um, and then as you're develop, as you're going into the second draft, the third draft, then you start shaping it in a way so that others can experience what it is that you experienced. So um, if you wanna show them what a great loss it was um, when you relinquished your child, then people need to understand how important it was for you to have that child. Um, uh, you know, some of the uh, notions of motherhood and all of that. Um, if, um, I once had a birth mother come up to me afterwards and tell me that she had um, been called by her, um, uh, she got a call from a, a woman, um, this was 50 years after relinquishment, and uh, the 
the the woman said, I, I have reason to believe that I'm I'm your daughter. And the woman just hung up on her. And she was so mortified that she had done that. And she came up to me after my reading and she like snuck up to me and she like whispered in my ear. She and she told me what happened. She said, Is that normal? And it's like for everything that she had gone through, it's totally normal to have that experience. And so in writing this story, then just give us all the things that you had gone through then so that we see how normal it is to have that feeling. So you just build up to it then in order to establish that. Um, so, and uh, the other thing is, um, if your audience, um, your audience might not understand the weird situation that can happen when you are, um, when you have that first reconnection, that have that first steps at reunion, that it's a reunion, but yet there is no prior relationship, no, um, no uh, emotional connection, though there is a physical. Um, and so help your reader understand what that is like. And so you give them all of the um, components of that, of what that means to you. And so as you're going from the first draft to the um, to a more finished draft, you're um, seeing what it is that the reader needs to understand and um, what it is you need to establish in order for that to work. Usually if a scene's not working, it's because you haven't done enough to build up to that moment. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're um, including all of that. Um, the other thing that might be keeping you from writing a memoir is, or writing your, um, your story is that you don't have enough time. So you gotta figure out what, how to be able to find the time to get into your story. Um, and so I think part of understanding what's keeping you from writing your story is just by naming it, then you can address what the challenge is in the, in the writing. And so um, I know Katrina Vandenberg, whose poetry has been included in John Green's um, works as the epigraph. What she did, um, she's full-time teaching at Hamlin and she um, had a new poetry book that was coming out and um, she also um, had a new baby. And so she had no time to write. And so she set a goal of writing one word a day and that's it. So, um, and what that allowed her to do then was at least be in touch with the material every day. And so be, f be familiar with it, um, be, thinking about it so that if she was able to write one word, then that was great. And if not, um, if that's all she did, then she hit that goal. Um, usually she was able to do a little bit more. And so she was always able to keep moving forward for it. So if you just keep small manageable goals that can really help you get towards um, the completed manuscript. I know um, we hear famously about Stephen King writing 2000 words a day. Um, most writers tend to just write a couple of pages a day. Um, if you write 500 words a day, that can be almost two pages. Um, and within a year or less than a year, um, then um, if it's one page a day, 300 pages, then you have a full manuscript or can. So those are some ways to be able to get through some of the um, problems of uh, actually writing the manuscript. Sometimes um, who or what is keeping us from writing the manuscript is because we worry about what other people are gonna think. What is it that they will do if they read the story? What, what will they think about how they are portrayed within the story? Um, and that is a little bit more complicated. So let's talk in a little bit more detail about what is entailed when um, that is what is keeping us from writing the story. Um, know that we've already talked about the first draft, um, that it's always really crummy anyway. Know that um, when you're writing the first draft, don't worry about anyone else reading it at that point. You are writing the first draft for yourself. So you write that with the door closed. And that's true no matter what kind of story you're writing. Just write it with the door closed. Don't worry about anyone else reading it. Um, the first time you're trying to write the story from your, for yourself, your story tends to become something else as you're writing it, because you're right as you're writing. That's what happens with stories. So um, let it become that thing that it wants to become. And so then um, you can just go back in your later revisions and adjust adjust the story to accommodate for what it is that it wanted to become. Let it become that. Um, if you're writing fiction and characters are going off in a weird direction, just let them do that too. That sort of thing. Um, so that's the first the first issue on writing on telling secrets. The other, and then in addition to telling 
in telling these secrets, there's a couple other problems that we face. And one is our memories are just really terrible sometimes. Um, and what do we do about the problem of memory? I'm going to give you an exercise at the um, um, in the next things I cover um, about trying to remember everything that will address that. But there are other problems of memories that exist too. And one is when we experience something, especially when we're growing up, it's just part of it can be just that we're at different ages. And depending on how old we are, we can remember things or not remember things so well, depending on um, how old we are when something happens. What is important to us at five is going to be different than what's important to us at 15. So how we process what happens is going to be different as well. Um, so those are a couple of reasons why memories might be different between people. Um, but it also can be different when, even when we're adults. Um, what it is that happens um, can be even different then. Um, there is a story of a memoirist who was present when her mother was dying and um, she was ex expressing just, oh my gosh, mom is already so cold. And uh, her sister on the other side of her at the same time said, um, I was just going to say how warm she still was. So even in the moment, we, experiencing, we experience things differently. So in order to um, reflect that in our stories, you need to make sure that you're characterizing the people in your story in a way that the reader gets that this is why they are might have a different experience, a different take on it. So make sure that you are characterizing your characters within your stories. And the hard thing when we have, um, when we're writing about people we know so well, we assume, we tend to think that just by naming them, we are characterizing them because when we give them their name on the page, all of who they are goes into that. Uh, but that's not enough for a reader. That's not enough for a stranger. And I'll give you some um, tips later on in my talk on how to be able to um, develop them a little bit more. Um, the other way to address the memory issue is to make sure that you are interrogating your memory. Um, and uh, you need to make sure that you're checking. So write down what it is um, that you remember of the events. But then you also want to go back and double check it against um, what photo albums are there, what diaries you had from the time, calendars, um, and other people present at the time. It's always a good idea to double check um, and interrogate your memory. Where what it is that you remember and what it is that actually happened don't align, then you want to explore that because that is something that is really interesting. Um, it means something um, to who you have become that you don't remember it. Um, in the way that it actually happened. So um, think about that. Uh, for me, uh, after my sister found out from when she got in a fight with the neighbor kid that, um, that we were adopted and he kind of hit the, they were fighting at each other and he didn't know what else to say. So he says, yeah, well, you're adopted. And she said, no, I'm not. He said, yeah, you are. And she said, no, I'm not. And he said, yeah, you are. Go ask, go ask your mom. So she did. And um, I was little uh, and all I knew was that my mom and my sister were upstairs fighting and crying and I, I just did not want to be a part of that. And my sister comes running downstairs and she says, Katie, guess what? We're adopted. And, you know, I'm little. I look like this and my parents have dark eyes and dark hair too. And my sister's blonde and blue eyed. And I looked at her and I said, well, maybe you are, but I'm not, which I think was the worst thing I could have told her right then. It was absolutely the worst. Um, and so uh, mom came down, she explained that um, they didn't know how to bring it up and then it was too late and how do you bring it up? Um, and then, you know, it was a lot of hugging and crying. And then um, she went back down to do laundry and um, Amy went upstairs and um, started calling all of her friends to tell them that we were adopted. And um, I, she wanted me there for comfort. And uh, then, mom came up with a big basket of laundry and she saw Amy on the phone and realized what she was doing. And she dropped the basket and she said, got to get off the phone, get off the phone. She said, it's not that it's anything bad. She said, it's just that it's just that it's none of their business because she was very Swedish and very um, matter of fact, and it's just, it's just not their business. So I don't remember what happened next. Um, and this is where um, I think that 
like when you don't remember something that's an important part of the story, that that's something that matters too. And so this, in my book, this is what I ended up writing into it then. You keep writing into it. And, you, and I realized that I could remember my mom taking me in her arms and comforting me, but I could not imagine her doing that for my sister. And I think that that matters because my sister then struggled with the fact that she was adopted. Um, she struggled with... Um, what that meant for her connection with mom um, and the adoptive mom and what that meant for her identity. Um, I don't need to explain that more for this group. You guys get that. So, um, but just what it is that you do remember and what it is that you don't remember is something interesting and it means something. So make sure that you're exploring that um, as part of the story. The other um, issue that can happen with memory is that or with telling the story is that sometimes the people who have the most issue with it have a problem of ownership. Um, they thought that they were the ones who, um, who owned the story, who owned the right to that secret, um, to write to the telling. I know that when I was writing my memoir um, upon release, um, it became an issue with one of my birth father's sisters. And um, the issue as um, we had talked more and worked through it, I discovered that the problem was that uh, she was the one who always wrote the Christmas cards for that family. And so here it was this stranger then telling the family story instead. So um, that was what uh, we had to work through and we were able to work through that. So those are a couple of initial things to be thinking about um, on the problem with telling. There are a couple of ways to address those challenges and just overall the challenge of telling the family secrets. And I want to talk about that now. Um, most important, when you are um, telling the story, it's important to remember. Um, it's important to remember that the reason for telling is not to tell everyone what a terrible thing happened to you, what a terrible thing this person did to you. That's not the reason to tell the story. Um, the reason we read memoir is not to um, hear, um, not to hear the, uh, uh, an account of tattling, um, but rather we want to understand, and this is um, as Cheryl Strayed put it, she says, we want to understand how to bear what it is we cannot bear. Mary Carr puts it this way. She says, it's important to understand how you struggled through. So um, these are the things to be focusing on. Um, you're telling the, the hard part um, just to the extent to which um, you help the reader understand how hard it was and what your struggle was, and then push beyond that to the point where you're able to share how you managed to struggle through, how you bore. This, um, this difficult moment. So if you had, for example, a difficult relationship with your adoptive mom, um, include that so that we can understand um, uh, your internal struggle um, when you decide not to tell her that you are in reunion to avoid hurting her feelings. And in that way, you help the reader understand the problems of um, adoption loyalty, uh, the loyalty we feel to adoptive parents. So we can um, understand how that works in play. So uh, some other things to be thinking about um, in this story, I wanna give a little bit more from this screen here. Um, and that is, I want you to be thinking about um, uh, the importance of what it is that you're sharing is, um, is that um, we talked about all those things that you want to focus on the change that happened, how you were changed because of the thing that happened to you. Um, so you want to be able to get to that point. Um, you want to be able to... Um, you want to keep your eye on what's important. And with that, what you want to be thinking about is um, so many times in the telling, we worry about the little nitpicky things that people um, have infighting on. But for the whole of your narrative arc, that little nitpicky thing might not matter at all for the whole of the narrative arc. I worked with one person who um, whose grandfather had this inkwell that he kept the 
wrote about his um, his diaries in, and she said, and everyone really got mad that I ended up with the inkwell, um, and so there's going to be a lot of talk about that. It's like, well, that doesn't isn't part of the story. The part of the story is that um, is just that that was the inkwell that he used for the te- uh, for the telling. So uh, sometimes we get we get we worry about. Um, we worry about the little things and that's not important for the whole of the story. So just keep your eye on what it is that's important for the telling of the story um, and let your reader understand where other people might have other interests um, that might be at play. Um, if uh, the if you talk about that John might have one way of uh, telling uh, one way of telling the story and Jack might have, uh, he might claim that it's John's fault and all you know is that you ended up with a concussion in the hospital that weekend. So then the reader can understand that they might have different ways, different takes on the story, but what really matters is that you ended up with a concussion. So just keep your eye on what's important. And how to convey those things that are important. Remember, um, this is Mary Carr's tip, tip, and remember she was the one who wrote Liar's Club. Um, the, the key is, is to use the details in the telling of the story, not labels. So for example, um, uh, don't say that the father was an alcoholic. Instead, you say that twice a week you had to search throughout the house. Uh, for the other, for another fifth of vodka to pour down the drain. So um, it's really important to be using those details. It's through the details that the reader will understand the story. That's how they process the story. So that will help you um, be able to uh, convey, uh, convey what it was to be at your situation then. When you're using those details, make sure that you're appealing to the sensory experience too. Make sure that you're creating a sense of smell, a sense of um, what texture might be present, uh, and the sounds. When we are trying to write our story, so often we focus on the visuals that we forget about the rest of the senses. So make sure that you're including all of the senses in the telling of the story. The other thing to remember in writing the story is you need to make sure you're including the whole of the story that you're developing at all. So um, for this then, if you would have your best friend read your, read your narrative, um, would your best friend say that you had left any part out? And what I'm getting at here is you need to make sure that you are as hard on yourself as you are on the other people included in this story. Because no protagonist is an angel. Um, and it's more interesting if you have that internal conflict where you're not always acting um, in your best interest. So let us see that part too. Um, and know too that um, this is just as important for the bad guys of our life stories. Um, remember that villains are a lot scarier if we can see a little bit of ourselves within them. Um, and if anyone has been watching Little Fires Everywhere, or if you've read the book, um, you know exactly uh, that um, that's, uh, that Celeste Ng had been able to uh, do this really well within her story. So that story is so effective because we feel for each of those um, main characters of the book, uh, and we feel the struggle that they went through, um, and we understand why they acted as they did, even though uh, it was against the, um, even though they ended up all fighting against each other. So, but we feel for each of their situations, and that's what you want to be able to create within your story too. So help us see all of those. Now, as we, you are thinking about your story, you need to consider what standards of truth you're going to follow. Um, you need to make sure that you're thinking, uh, well, for this, think about James Frey um, when he wrote A Million Little Pieces and uh, everyone loved the book um, and until Oprah, until we realized that it wasn't really a memoir, that he had made a lot of it up and then Oprah chewed him out on her couch. So the story behind that is that he had initially shot the story as a novel and then the initial reaction coming back from publishers was that, well, this would be a lot more interesting if it was memoir. And he said, oh, well, it can be memoir. Um, it was pretty much memoir anyway. But the problem was is that he did um, 
blow up the circumstances. He made them bigger than they actually were. He conflated some people. Um, this happened with Greg Mortensen too. He conflated um, events so that it didn't actually happen that way, but he, he pushed them together or um, put a couple of different ones together in one to make it appear it all happened at the same time. Um, and people felt betrayed by that too. So you need to make sure that you're conveying to the reader what it is that's true um, and make sure that you are only telling the truth if you're writing memoir. And if you're writing fiction, then you have more leeway to be able to develop that. But um, you want to make sure you're leading the reader by the hand um, and showing them um, what is true and where you're, you can be honest and let them know, I, I don't remember this exactly, but this is what I've been able to piece together. Um, if you've read Educated by Tara Westover, you can see how she addresses that within her book. So I encourage you to keep reading and seeing how other authors of memoirs or fiction have addressed other things, um, similar issues that you're facing too. Then think about... Um, this duty to notify. You are supposed to let the folks know who are in your story that they are in your story. This is the standard established by Lee Gutkind, who is known as the godfather of nonfiction. Um, he's taught, he's led the program at the University of Pittsburgh for years, and he's the editor of Creative Nonfiction Magazine. Um, he says to just share the facts of what you're sharing. Mary Carr got everyone together in a big beach house and gave them the whole of her manuscript and she sat there while they read. Um, I don't know that I would be able to do um, to do that too, but I did share uh, my manuscript with um, the different folks who were who showed in my um, in my memoir. And I think that that's important to do. Um, through that, then I was able to get further insight in a conversation I had with a, a good friend of mine who is an adoptive mom um, when she shared with me some things about the challenges of, of being in touch with the birth mother. And um, so when I sent that conversation that we had that I was including in the book, when I sent that to her, she said, yeah, that's what happened. She said, but really what I was getting at was this. And so by sharing it with her, I was able to develop the story um, into a more poignant moment. So um, it does serve you well in order to do that. Um, it helps confirm that your research is true. Um, that said, um, what you share with the people who are in your story, um, you can decide at what point you're sharing it with them. I know one author who um, she got her sister on board um, with got her okay about sharing this story um, before she started writing it. Um, she sent um, the she sent the galley copy to her dad. And at the galley copy stage, the story is written. Um, you can make some changes to it, but it has to be really important in order to make those changes. Um, so she sent her dad the copy at that stage. For her mother, with whom she didn't have a good relationship, she sent her um, the first um, edition copy. So it's like, this is it, mom. This is what, um, this is the story. Just wanted to let you know, um, here it is. So um, you can decide at what stage you're going to include somebody in this story. What this gets down to is that you're going to need to prioritize what's more important, telling the story or the relationship. So um, if um, so, you want to think about um, if you want their input and you want and that relationship is important to you to uphold and maintain, then include them earlier in the story. And if it's just someone um, that you don't have a good relationship with, then it's um, it's okay to let them know later in the process. Um, Mary Carr's sister was not happy about being included in her memoir and asked um, for a lot of changes. And Mary Carr started working on uh, working the sister out of the story entirely. And the sister um, said, you know what, if that's the case, then I'm, I'm actually okay with how things are. So uh, just know that um, you either need to, uh, you will have to address if they have any feedback for you, how you want to, how you're gonna address that. You're gonna wanna think about that ahead of time too. So just, I'm giving you these standards to be thinking about. Know that Anne Lamott, um, who has written many wonderful books, um, she has said that uh, she advises this. She says, you own everything that happened to you. So tell your stories. If people wanted you to write warmly about them, they should have behaved better. So know that um, that guidance is given by Anne Lamott. Know, too, that Annie Dillard 
uh, who is known as a great essayist, um, has written that writing is an art, but it is not a martial art. So um, the whole point of writing is um, to show that internal struggle uh, that we have. So um, you need to balance the two ands um, between Anne Lamont and Annie Dillard. Um, and so how do we do that? The point of writing is to write toward um, the discovery of what we don't know, of what we're still trying to figure out or understand about our past. And if you're writing into that discovery, um, you will have a good story. William Zinzer, who is on the list of recommended readings I get, um, I gave you guys um, or that is available for you guys um, he advises to try and shape your story as some sort of quest uh, to have on the first page this realization of a journey that needs to be taken and um and uh so through the course of your story, you're going to show us how difficult that journey is, what hardships you had along the way, and how you faced them. And so by your last page, then you're showing, um, you show the last step taken on the last page, and and then you reflect back, then you that you have kind of an echo back to the beginning of how long, how far you have come. And so if you're able to set up your story as some sort of quest, um, think of it that way. That's how stories have been told uh, for thousands of years since Homer, someone by the name of Homer, uh, first told a story. So those are the big uh, ideas to be thinking about in telling your story and the way to be able to manage telling of the secret. Um, I want to give you some thoughts on um, what to do about shaping your story and remembering everything. Um, if we were in a class, I would have you write a whole bunch um, through this part, but I wanted to give you some guidance on um, what it is that you try and, uh, try and remember. And so let me um, walk you through what that what that will be. For that, um, you're going to be thinking about a few different things, and that is um, people, places, and um, and things. Uh, you're going to think also about what times you're going to be including in your story. So for that, then, what you want to do is think about all of the times you need to include in your story. What events are you going to include? Um, of the events, um, start, try listing them out. Try listing um, 20 events that you need to make sure that you're including in your life story. Um, make sure that you write down all the ones that you know need to go into your story. Once you um, do that, then think about of those that you have listed, do all of those really fit within the whole of your story? Which of them best show what attitude you have towards life and toward the problem that you face? What of them um, best reflect the arc that you're going to have in your story, the journey that you, you will be depicting through the course of your story? Also, as you look at the list of events that you, are, that you have, think of, you will notice that some of them sort of repeat the same sort of problem in the same sort of way that you attack the problem. And so you want to of those, you want to pick only one, which one best represents what larger life you lived. Think, too, about what else ha was happening in the world at this time that allows your reader a way to connect, to figure out where they fit into the story. Um, it gives them uh, a way to enter the story. And then um, you want to provide at least three of those and then think about how the events are connected. As for the people in your story, I want you to make a list of all the people who changed you. And so these will be the people you want to make sure you're including in your story. And then I talked about, you know, these are the things you want to be mindful of in developing them as characters. You want to provide your readers or provide a stranger what it is that they need to know to pick this person out of a crowd. And then be mindful of like how you would envision them as you get closer. Um, think about what it, are the key things that this person says. Make sure whatever phrasing that they use, make sure that you're including that, um, how it is that they say it. Remember, um, what are the key things like for a person who doesn't know this, for a, a reader who doesn't know this person, what is it that they need to know about how this person moves through the world um, and how they um, how they move and, and what it is that they do um, in, so that we can picture them. Consider what are the moments that they shared with you that show that were a part of how you became you. So think about three moments in time, um, how things were in the beginning, how things were at the end, and what was the midpoint. And then, so 
make sure that you're including each of those scenes and then share too, or, and then just work on developing those scenes. Think about what was present in that moment, um, what you can, what senses you can evoke um, from that moment, um, sounds, smells, um, sense of texture from that moment. Um, and then what are the key things that you remember from that moment? What is it that still gives you comfort that they said to you in that moment? What is it that keeps you up at night that they said? What are the things that you remember that they said? This is how we can include dialogue in the stories that we write about people. So know that when you introduce them, you want to provide for your reader just two things on introduction. And that is you want to give them some physical aspect about this person that that gives us an idea of who they are and then also something about their attitude, the attitude that they carry. Um, say, for instance, um, someone, um, a man has a strong jaw and he's always the first person through the room. We can kind of picture what kind of person that would be. Um, so think about what are two things that would give us an idea of then um, the character that will be built through the course of the story. And then the way that we treated the people in our lives, you wanna do that too for the places of our lives as well. Think about them from a distance, think about them up close, think about um, what was present in the room for the key events, what it is that we need to know in order to be present in that room. And if we are all um, players on the stage of life, then think about what are the props for us as players on this stage. Um, sometimes in difficult moments, we can work through um, just make a list of all the things that were present and then um, start writing an essay just about one of those things. And um, I know Lori Lake then was able to uh, recapture a particularly difficult moment in her life in this way. And so um, by focusing on the concrete, you can then um, pair back and see the whole, see a big thing. We talked about um, the importance of quest and, and structuring structuring a story in that way. Remember that um, in telling story, the protag we feel most connected to protagonists who take action. Um, and it is through their hard decisions that they make that they um, become the changed person at the end. And so you want to be thinking about these things that happened to you. What were the course? What was the course of action that you took? What was the struggle that you had in meeting uh, those challenges? And help us see then how you were changed at the end. A lot of times, uh, authors will put the protagonist in a very similar uh, situation as they are at the opening of the story in order to show how different they are at the end than from the beginning. So um, I've got a lot more detail on structure on the handout. So take a look at that and make sure that you're reading and rereading your favorite stories and see how those stories introduce journey um, and people and the conflicts. And so that brings me to the end of my talk. I have time for questions for folks then too. Okay, so we did have a couple of questions. Um, when, Great. Great. Um, or really one question and one comment so um, about memories and um, that the often uh, memoirs contain a lot of dialogue and that this person doesn't keep a journal um, so she would have a hard time recreating conversations. So and that's true and that's true for everyone we don't go around in life with a dictaphone um, uh, though though you know there's always the uploaded <laughs> conversations now um, too. Um, that is why uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that that those techniques that I walked you through about uh, which scenes develop from the important people in our lives. Think about um, for these moments, we only include the conversations that matter. Um, so those are the only ones that we include all the niceties, all the little um, Manner, mannerisms that we do when we're meeting people that we don't include in the story. We only include the dialogue that matters, um, that have mattered for us. And so the way to capture that is that you know the people who said those, the things to you that mattered in your life, um, you know how they talk and you know um, what it is that has stayed with you and you know what it is that has brought you comfort and what it is that uh, still still bothers you that they said that. So um, 
it is because we remember it that we're able to record it and have it as dialogue. And people understand that um, when they're reading memoir, they understand that that is the process. So, um, so it's okay to be able to generate it through an exercise like I walked you guys through. So. Um, the other comment relating to that, somebody had a good idea of um, going back and looking up things on Facebook to be able to remember what happened. You know, some people post a lot of details on Facebook about what's going on in their lives. So yes. that was helpful. That's, that's, that's a really great, um, that's a really great uh, way to do it. Um, and there was a question on where to find the handout again. If you go to um, my website, katevogel.com, um, of the pages that are on the website, go to the appearances page, click on appearances. Once you click on appearances, then you'll see um, different places I've been. And this talk is on the top right hand side and just click on the title of the talk, ups and downs of um, the adoption story. You should write a book. Just click on that and that'll get you to download the, the, um, the handout from tonight. Um, face, um, Facebook is a really great way to be able to recapture the moment. Um, if you have any diaries or journals, um, that's another way to be able to go back and see the moment. Know that you cannot just include um, the diary entries because that's not part of the whole of your narrative. So the reader will feel the unevenness of it if you're just copying and pasting and dropping it in. So it has to be part of the whole narrative. Um, you will find that the stories that you've told at, at um, uh, when you're together with friends, at, you know, at a bar, or at a dinner party, um, those stories will come more easily to you as you're writing that as part of the whole. But again, you'll um, it will need to fit into the whole of the story. I know that um, I had a couple of those types of stories that I dropped into my draft. And then when I had my early readers look at it, they're like, this is good, but it just feels kind of clunky where it is. And so that's why people feel that way. So it just needs to make sure that you're rewriting it with the whole of the art told. If you tell your story as part of a writing group, you will find that you tend to tell it in a chunk that, um, um, that is pleasing for your writing group so that when you stretch it out into the whole of a book, you'll need to make sure that it, you're stretching the arc then over the whole of the book. Otherwise, the reader will feel like a little bump and then a little bump and then a big bump. And so just for what it is that you submitted to your writing group. So that can be part of it, too. What other questions do we have? I haven't gotten any in email. Um, anybody else have any questions that you want to put in chat or email to me? Okay, well, we'll while we're watching, if there's any last ones, I will reassure people too about the handout in the PowerPoint presentation that we will be posting um, the recording on the adoptionnetwork.org website and we will have the handout in the presentation posted along with that. Um, and I see some questions here and um, know that if uh, for Laura's question about um, you only recall call portions of the dialogue, it could be Laura that the parts that you remember are the parts to include and then the parts that you don't remember um, those parts, uh, it could be um, if you describe the setting, you can convey the feeling that's happening and then also you can include um, through narrative, just by describing the conversation. Then we talked about things that were important to us at the time, like that, you know, and you can, you can describe it in general, and it's just the parts of the dialogue that you remember that are still vivid. Um, those are the parts that you can put in quotes then too. So maybe that's one way to go about doing it. Also then share the, that dialogue with the person who was present, and then they might have um, other things to add that, that, when they recall it, then you can, sometimes it's like, yeah, definitely, I need to include that. And other things might be, well, that's not an important part of what I'm trying to establish here. So it just depends on what it is you're trying to accomplish through that particular scene. As far as other um, favorite non-adoption memoirs, um, I tell you, um, my favorite memoir of all time is Cal Kalia Yang's The Song Poet. I think it is beautifully written. And I was a judge for the Minnesota Book Awards the year that that came through. And it just blew me away. Um, it is still my favorite memoir of all time. Um, and I think uh, 
she also wrote The Late Homecomer, which I did not enjoy as much. It was a good memoir, but just the song poet I thought was just beautiful. Um, another memoir that I really enjoy is Tara Westover's Educated. I thought that that was really well written. And know that when she was writing that, what she would do, what she was listen to the New Yorker podcasts, um, uh, the stories every week um, by the New York, once a month for the New Yorker, they will have a writer um, uh, read a story from the past and then uh, the fiction editor and that writer will just talk about the story. And so she just listened to those and her favorite ones, she listened like 50 times, really seriously, that many times. And so through that, then she got a really good sense of the structure of fiction. And if you read Educated, it's like she does such a fabulous job of structuring that. So um, just a really good job telling. So um, those are a couple of really um, good uh, non-adoption memoirs that I've enjoyed too. Um, and as far as standard page length for memoirs, um, know that generally between 80,000 80, words and 100,000 words are um, the sweet spot that you're trying to hit. If you can be more 80 to 90,000, that's where uh, publishers will want that, that to be. Um, generally, that's about 250 to 300 pages is, is what they like it to be. If it's less than that, um, you don't have enough. You need to beef it up a little bit more. If it's too much, then it's too expensive to publish, basically. So you got to trim it down. Um, and be mindful of only including the scenes that, um, uh, that are representative of, of the different points along the way of, of your, of the journey that you've taken. So, um, and don't worry if your first draft is only a hundred pages, um, that first draft, again, you're just telling the story to yourself. And then once you have it down, then you can look at it and see, oh, okay, I've got this, but in order, um, so, so much of what we do in the first draft is just, um, telling what the story is and it's too general. So you wanna make sure that you're getting more specifics, more details. You wanna make sure that you're providing concrete and tangible and specific um, specific things in your story. For instance, you don't wanna just write fruit, you wanna say strawberries. <laughs> so it's just it's things like that. Help, help the reader be able to picture what it is that you're talking about. Um, make sure that you've got a vivid image on each page and um, make sure that um, we are feeling the struggle, that um, we're not sure which way a scene is gonna go. And if you can be able to create that, um, that's what keeps the reader turning the page when they're not sure um, what choice will be made, what hard decision will be made. Um, when we're worried for the, um, when we're worried for you um, because of the hard things that you've been through, that is what we will keep turning the page for in order to see how you turned out okay at the end. We want to know your wisdom because you've got, and only you can write the story that you have to tell. So you need to write it. Kate, along the lines of um, length, are there anthologies of memoirs? So if somebody wrote a shorter memoir, is that... I don't know that I've ever seen an anthology of memoirs, but. Well, actually, um, as a matter of fact, um, Cal Kalia Yang and Shannon Gibney have an anthology that's out about um, what God, um, what God has, what gods have came or something like that. And it's about um, Native American um, women and women of color who have lost babies. Um, so this, the, the trauma of um, stillborn births or miscarriages. And so it's really a beautiful collection. Um, what those are called um, personal essays, basically, are what those are called. Um, and if you have a short little pieces published, um, you can get those published. And for instance, Meredith Hall wrote a short little piece about killing chickens. She was struggling, um, you know, she had a chicken coop and she would go out there and kill chickens and was trying to find anything to feed her two little boys. So, um, and this first essay um, ended up being part of, and that was how she got an agent for her Without a Map, which is a beautiful memoir um, about uh, the struggles of being a birth mother. So, um, so that's indeed how a lot of memoirs get written is, is just one little piece of um, the whole story, um, but that in itself it feels whole. So you can look to get those published. If they're super short, like 750 words, then a place like Brevity or Hippocampus would be interested in publishing that. And what you can do is get a book called Best of um, American Essays. Every year they publish a new one and you can read that. And the ones that feel like um, the ones that you like the best, the ones that you would, these are my top three, look to see where those are published. And then you can try submitting your 
um, your short essay um, to those places. And that's one way to go about doing it. Great. You've been a wealth of information. Thank you so much. So, so you're welcome. It was a real treat to be here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this. Um, and just thank you, Betsy, for all you and Adoption Network Cleveland is doing. So thanks for this. Thank you. Um, Thank so you. as many people know, Adoption Network Cleveland is a nonprofit organization. Um, we serve individuals and families impacted by adoption, um, kinship care, and foster care. Um, we're very excited to be partnering with so many wonderful experts in our national community to offer this Monday um, evening speaker series. And again, if you have ideas for topics or speakers, you can let me know. Uh, we are a membership organization, and I hope that you'll consider joining as a member. You can find out more about Adoption Network Cleveland and membership and how to support us at our website, which is adoptionnetwork.org. Um, and next week, we're excited to bring Dr. Jennifer King, who's going to um, be talking about ACEs, Beyond ACEs, Understanding Trauma of the Brain and Building Resilience. And she's also a wonderful presenter. So Kate, thank you one more, um, one more time. It's great to thank see you. you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Betsy. Great to see you, too. Thanks for all the yeah. good work Adoption Network Cleveland does. Thanks. 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 Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.